well, we could we could probably talk about the whole interview on that, but uh, it, it really was one of the stimuluses of the book. Obviously, nitrogen is the subject of a lot of books. Organic gardening is based on the idea that you're getting, you know, natural nitrogen, the right kind of nitrogen, et cetera, et cetera. And so in this instance, uh, you know, we're, we're dealing with a situation where people were using regular fertilizers, not regular fertilizers, but just normal inputs, manures, et cetera, et cetera. And one day, somebody got up in the British Society of Science and said, wait a second, we're running out of nitrogen, and challenged the world scientists to develop artificial nitrogen. And lo and behold, someone finally did in Germany. Uh, of course, the story is well known. And, and these, this nitrogen became a, a artificial manure, a fertilizer. And then shortly after that, World War I, World War II, and the nitrogen was being used for munitions. Uh, and, and so as a result of that, uh, the wars ended, the munitions were converted into fertilizers, and uh, the production of nitrogen is artificially completely outpaced what the original production of nitrogen was like. So over 50% of the nitrogen in your body is artificial nitrogen. Now it's nitrogen, but it was made, you know, using a man-made process, not using a micro process. So it's just a fascinating, uh, you know, sort of out outlook on, you know, where we are in terms of gardening and farming, you know, we used to have natural nitrogen. Now we're using artificial nitrogen. We're having a lot of problems now. It's, it's, and we're going back to the natural nitrogen again. So it's a nice cycle, I hope, that we're gonna see. Because when you apply nitrogen in an artificial form, uh, it, you know, the plant is sort of forced fed that nitrogen and what happens, we've discovered, is that the plants kind of shut down a lot of their systems. They say, whoa, wait a minute, I'm getting free lunch. Why am I spending all of my energy, you know, trying to attract microbes and feed myself? I'm getting free lunch. And so they, they react differently in the soil. Uh, and I suppose hydroponically as well, but certainly in the soil, they, they react differently. So they stop attracting mycorrhizal fungi, for example because they don't need them. They don't need to spend the energy to keep them alive. It's a symbiotic relationship. And so uh, they, 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 they cut back on the need for nitrogen fixation because they're getting free nitrogen. So they don't have to form those nodules and att attract the bacteria. All of this stuff, sending signals out into the soil, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation. The plant has to run through, spends a lot of its photosynthetic energy producing exudates which drip out into the system to do all these things maybe 50% of its energy, maybe 60% of its energy. And then all of a sudden you're giving it free food and it says, whoa, I can keep that energy for myself. And I don't have to spend it. I can relax a little bit. And so you get a different situation for the plant. And then the plant becomes dependent on you. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And particularly with the artificial. I mean, that's, a, that's an obvious problem. Yeah. Uh, you know, I always like to point out that gardeners use four times more nitrogen than farmers. So when you think about that little spot down at the bottom of the Mississippi Delta, you know, you can't just think that's just farmers. If you are using chemical nitrogens, they are, they are for all intents and purposes, you know, running into the water system. And, and uh, some of it is hitting the plant, some of it's being taken in. If you're using an organic nitrogen, it's, it's held in the soil. In particular, it's held in the bodies of the microbes and the, and the bigger organisms that eat the microbes. So it stays there. And it's there, it's available when it's needed. Big difference, big difference. The example is the nitrogen that's created by nitrogen fixing bacteria. So I've got, I've got two books out in, in print. One of them is called Teeming with Microbes, and it explains the soil food web. And, and the way the soil food web works is the, the uh, if I can explain a you know, 200 page book in about 30 seconds, the plant produces these things, they drip out of the roots. They're called exudates. It uses this photosynthetic energy, as I said, up to 50, 60% of it, to produce these things. Not the tomato, blah, blah, blah. These things drip out of the root system and attract bacteria and fungus, because they need the carbon that's in these uh, wonderful little exudates. Long come protozoa, like paramecium and amoeba, and nematodes, which are these little teeny microscopic worms, and they eat the bacteria and the fungus because, I mean, yeah, the bacteria and the fungus because they too need protein and nitrogen and carbon in particular, so mostly carbon. 
They eat what they need, they poop out what they don't need, and they're doing this all right there in the root system, the rhizosphere. And lo and behold, what they poop out is in plant usable form, and the plant is feeding itself. It attracts the right kind of microbes in order to feed it what it needs. Amazing. And then you have these mycorrhizal fungi that they attract. They send a little signal out. The, 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 the fungi reacts to the signal, enters into the root system, and you end up with these beautiful, but very tiny uh, uh, extensions to the root system that go out, they're fungi, they go out and they bring back food and they feed the plant in return for those exudates. And they get nitrogen, which we've just talked about, they get uh, phosphorus in particular, they get copper, they get water, they do all sorts of terrific things for the plant, and 96% of the plants have these things. Now you come along with artificial nitrogen, and the plant goes, wow, I don't need to support those guys. I don't need to do this. It changes the whole situation. So it's fascinating. So, so the, the, the second book, however, is what happens it's with the nitrogen that's produced, how does it get into the plant? And then once it gets in the plant, what does it do inside the plant? And it's here that you begin to recognize that there's really two kinds of nitrogen that plants take in, ammonia and urea. And depending on what kind of plant and where they are, they like one over the other. And so if you're a good gardener, you try to figure out which one, which nitrogen your plant prefers. And that's all part of the, the system of the books. Now I've got a third book coming out in January on the mycorrhizal fungi themselves, because they're that important. There are that many plants that have them. They are the reason we have life on Earth today, plants associated with these fungi and came on Earth. And, and so uh, as a result, all of this stuff plays together. And when you disrupt the system, you find out that the fungi don't work, the nitrogen fixing don't work, the, the, the soil food web becomes disrupted, the plant maybe is getting the wrong kind of nitrogen, and all of a sudden, first of all, you're glad you read all three books because you understand what's going on, but, but you can see how the whole system works, and that's really, really, really important. We spend too much time on mythology as gardeners and farmers. You know, my grandfather did this, and my grandmother said do that, and you know, we make compost the way she did it. No, we need to know the science behind all this stuff. We need to get into it that way. You know, if you've got this natural system, why do you need to fertilize? There are a lot of people who will argue that you don't need to fertilize. So for example, you don't need to fertilize the redwood forests. Nobody ever fertilizes the redwoods. Look at the size and the age of those guys. Well, you don't need to fertilize because they have a fully functioning soil food web working there. They're getting the right kind of nitrogen for each of the individual plants in that particular forest. You don't need to fertilize. You go to a farm or a garden situation and we break a key rule of nature, which is called the law of return. What falls down from a tree or a plant in nature, the plant itself eventually goes into the ground because it falls down on the ground and it decays. And it, it, the nutrients that were in that plant go back into the soil. Wonderful situation. You're a farmer, you come along, you cut the plant take it out of the garden or the farm, you take the fruit off the orchard trees, and all of a sudden you are violating the law of return. So the reason you need to fertilize is because you need to put the equilibrium back again. And so you feed your microbes the food that they would have gotten had you left things alone. So that's why you fertilize. And it's really easy because you just figure out what kind of microbes you want to be growing around what kind of plants, and you're there. And that's really easy because you can divide it into two different groups. You have soil where the plants attract more fungi than bacteria, and then you have soil that attract more bacteria than fungi. If you've got soil that's got more bacteria in it, then that likes what we call nitrate, and if you have uh, the soils that have more fungi, they like ammonia. And the way you can tell the difference between the plants, if it's in the ground for more than a year, likelihood it's going to like the fungi-dominated soil. If it's in the ground for less than a year, so you're talking about all the row crops, 
uh, then it's going to be, you know, your flowers, your, your annual flowers, it's going to be uh, the nitrate. Really, pretty simple. So it's just figuring out where your, what, you know, where your plant really sits. So, and you got to really think about it. So, for example, a bulb, a, a spring flowering bulb. <clears throat> well, that turns out to be more like an annual because every year a new bulb is produced underneath it. Interesting. Hmm. What about a strawberry? Well, you know, a strawberry, hmm, is it bacterial or is it fungal? You know, well, I, you know, I'll let the audience figure that out. You know, is it in the ground for more than a year? Where do you find strawberries? You know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting exercise and you can do it with each and every plant you grow. And you suddenly figure out, you know, what you need to be feeding them. And then you can feed them the kinds of foods that, that are supportive of either fungi or of bacteria. That's a mouthful, I would say. Well, absolutely, if you could leave all of it on the ground, that would be great, but you would not turn it over. Because that is another thing that we do that really screws things up. We rototill. That's rototilling. And, and the reason why people do it, uh, you know, they think what, what's happening is that they're putting organic material into the, into the soil. Um, but it turns out that it, that it really does a lot of destruction to the soil food web. It's okay to rototill if you're taking fungally dominated soil and you want to grow bacterially dominated stuff because when you rototill, you break up the fungal network and you, you create this, this fine pulverized stuff that's easy for bacteria to eat and so you end up with a bacterially dominated soil. That's great if you're taking old growth forests and, and, and converting them into an area where you're going to grow you know, broccoli and, 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 and squash. Uh, you know, it's not good if you want to grow old growth forest. You just got yeah. so we rototill way too much. We break up this network of fungi, which contains or puts into the soil most of the carbon that goes into the soil. So rototilling is not a good idea. Leaving it alone is a great idea. Letting stuff just fall down and leaving it there is a great idea. I never rake leaves up on my property unless I need them for a compost pile. I never take grass clippings up unless I need them for a compost pile. What falls down from a plant is supposed to stay on the ground near the plant. Simple as that. There are the essential elements. Now the first book was, you know, how, how the food gets to the plant. The second book was how the plants eat. And, and, uh, and of course in doing that, what do the plants exactly eat? Because I wanted to figure out literally how did the stuff that was in the soil, in the microbes, get inside the cells of the plant? Just was curious. Uh, I was sitting in a restaurant one day and I'm looking at a picture of a bunch of women eating spaghetti and I said, well, how do plants eat? So uh, it turns out, most gardeners realize that there are essential elements and, and uh, you know, that, that plants take in 17 elements. That's it. That's all they need. They don't need anything else. And so they take these elements in and they can convert those elements into every single substance inside a plant which is an incredible situation. So uh, uh, they are able to convert these 17 elements into every strand of DNA, uh, all the nucleotides, you know, all of the fats, all of the proteins, you know, every single part of the plant uh, comes from these 17 elements. And 95% of them are carbon, oxygen, and water. I mean, my goodness gracious, so these other guys aren't very much. But you gotta have every single one of them or the plant will not be considered a living organism, which is something that grows and then breeds, reproduces. Now, this is sort of an amazing thing to talk to gardeners about because many, particularly organic gardeners, and well, wait a second, I am putting uh, kelp. I'm putting kelp on my, on my garden. Kelp has 55, 60 different elements in it. You're telling me plants only have 18 elements in it. Well, kelp isn't a plant, which is the first thing. But the second thing is, yeah, but it doesn't need anything but those 17 elements. If you're lacking one of those 17 elements, it doesn't matter what else you're putting on that plant, it's not going to live. And by live, I mean, of course, grow and reproduce. So, so you know, we, we tend to 
you know, we know about NPK, it's on our fertilizer bags and everything else, uh, you, know, you know, but it's important to know that, you know, boron is needed in order to have plants flower and, you know, that it's important to know what the phosphorus does, you know, how it's part of ATP, for example, you know, the en energy currency of, the, it's, it's, a, it's a different experience to know what happens inside a plant with these elements that are in the soil uh, it all of a sudden gives you a slightly different appreciation, I should say a greater, much greater uh, uh, different appreciation for plants and what they are and how they operate. I mean, a single plant, an, you know, an apple tree in your backyard, it's got like 36 trillion cells. I mean, my God, and every one of those cells is connected. If you were small enough, you could get inside the cell and literally canoe from one cell to another cell. Wow, it's amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. So uh, I got carried away in the second book. I got a little curious about, about you know, how plants eat and, and, and uh, got into those elements big time. And, and if you go into the book, I explain what each individual element does and it is absolutely fascinating. Again, you're missing uh, sulfur. Well, you're not able to make a certain number of proteins. And if you can't make those proteins, you just don't live. It's all fascinating stuff. And then the science uh, has advanced so far and, and it is so accessible to a lay person such as myself that some of the photographs, for example, and scientific papers that, 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 that were covered, unbelievable single strands of DNA pictures and all sorts of phenomenal stuff. So I think my appreciation of plants went way beyond the soil food web and how they operate in the soil food web when I got into the elements that plants eat. Well, uh, obviously uh, you want to have the very best plants possible. So that requires you get the very best stock possible, either cuttings uh, or, or uh, seeds, you have to do that. The second thing is I think you have to absolutely know what kind of mycorrhizal fungi those plants associate with. Now, not, you know, the only plants really that you don't have to worry about are things your kids don't like to eat, the cabbages and, you know, broccoli, that family. Uh, but all the other plants you put in your garden have an association with the mycorrhizal fungi. And we're able to buy mycorrhizal fungi now, not every one, but we are able to buy uh, enough of them to be able to inoculate and infect our own plants from the get-go. So if you live in a place like Alaska, for example, we start a lot of our plants indoors. And so we roll our seeds in the appropriate mycorrhizal fungi, and from the very start, those plants are associating with that fungi, and that fungi is going out into the little teeny pores that the roots can't reach and getting all the food it needs. So the second thing I would do if I was planting in a backyard garden is I would make sure I had the appropriate mycorrhizal fungi uh, and uh, that I knew how to apply it. It's very easy. Uh, you basically roll the seeds in it, and if it's a plant, you just make sure that it touches the roots, you roll the roots in it. Uh, there's a liquid now that you can actually spray on, so that's really easy. The third thing I would do uh, is make sure that the natural conditions are right. You know, you know, if it's a seed that's supposed to have been frozen, I want to make sure that's all that can happen. I want to make sure that the soil temperature is temperature. If it's a cool crop, it goes in early. If it's a warm crop, I have to wait until the temperature is right, because I learned in the second book about all of the enzymatic reactions that occur inside plant cells, and they are temperature related. So for example, well, it's, it's hard to imagine, there are you know, uh, uh, a thousand different enzymes in every single cell in a plant, and 10,000 10, examples of each one. So if you don't get the right, and they speed up things based upon, oh my god, they're phenomenal. So, so you wanna make sure there's the right temperature. Um, obviously, you want to make sure that you've got water uh, and that the water is applied first so that the garden is wet before you put anything down on it. Uh, and uh, then I think you just want to get going. No rototilling. You don't need a rototill. If you want to break up soil at all, the least amount of disturbance is all that you should be doing. I take a dowel or a two by four and just run it down the side of this. You don't have to disturb the whole garden just to plant a few seeds, it's crazy. Uh, so that's about it, really easy. And if you live in a place like Alaska, you, oh, well, one thing I left off, you've gotta have the right mulch. There are no bare soils in nature. And so you wanna cover the soil with the appropriate kind of mulch. And you can get some mulches that support bacterial growth and some mulches that support fungal growth. 
And so they, you know, they support both, but dominant one over the other. Uh, and, and you want to make sure that you have the mulch down in the garden. There are no bare soils in nature. Right. Soil testing I would do in the fall, uh, and I think it's very important for two reasons. One, you absolutely cannot know what your plants need unless you test the soil. Simple as that. And we all know that information is power. Let's be, you know, good farmers and good garden farmers do it. Absolutely they do it, but gardeners don't. I, very few gardeners ever test their soil, really. Get a good test. And pick a lab that you're going to be able to go back to because you want to test it again in another couple, two or three years to see how your soil is trending. Are you doing the right things? So you get a good lab, you tell them you're organic, you want the test to be organic, and you want the recommendations to be organic. So if you have compacted soil that's clay, adding organic matter is the only way you're going to get that clay to default, you know. And, and so you've got to add organic matter, and the easiest way to add organic matter may be rototilling. It also may be adding compost teas. Uh, and compost itself uh, is, is extremely useful, uh, and the microbes in the compost will work its way down, but you've got to have organic matter, absolutely. Uh, the, the first thing that goes in a compacted garden, in a, com a compacted soil, are the, are the fungi. They're very fragile. And so you need to replace those. So, so you know, you might want to aerate a yard and then throw down compost so that it goes down into those individual holes. Uh, lately, there's been a tremendous movement towards cover cropping. Uh, and in, in soils, uh, you know, such as you've described, they use, uh, you know, carrots, um, daikon. The soil around the St. Louis Arch, uh, my friend James uh, Satilo uh, is taking care of a revamping of the of the uh, planting around the arch, the whole area is being revamped, and the soil was unbelievably compact. And I don't know whether it's because people walked on it or whatnot. And he planted daikon radishes there. Boy, did he catch a rift of heck uh, from the people of St. Louis who could not understand what he was doing uh, until he showed them what the soil is like now. Unbelievable. So yeah, there are lots of things you can do, and you should do it, because you want to have soil that's good, good structure, and got a lot of organic matter in it. There's two kinds of clover. You know, you want to get the annual clover for cover crops. So that you, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I can remember back in the day when I was uh, a, a chemical head, uh, and wow, boy, I remember the first little bit. Of, I, I, I've got we, my wife and I, have qu quite a large lawn, uh, and and uh, I can remember the first bit of clover coming into that lawn. It was weed free, absolutely weed free, and I, I'm embarrassed to tell you it's a couple of acres at least, and. Uh, I'm embarrassed to tell you why it was read for you, but I think you can guess. And, and boy, here comes my conversion, and all of a sudden there's a little clump of clover. And, and you know, it took a little while to get used to, but today, oh, I love the clover. Here's the thing about clover that people don't understand. It used to be in lawn seed. It used to be in lawn seed in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. And then one day someone took a picture, you know, during a golf match, the U.S. Open, I think in the 19, early 1950s, first color television sets. The fairway, beautifully green, no weeds. Boom, next thing you know, we got an industry that's trying to kill weeds, selling grass seed, uh, feeding each other, and bye-bye clover. But it used to be a demanded part of lawns. They fix nitrogen. Yeah. I mean, you know, my gosh. It's unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. You want, and it stays greener longer, I have to say, in drought. You want it in your lawn. It's a beautiful plant. Really, we're not fertilizing. We're not fertilizing the plant. What we're doing when we organically garden, when we are soil food webbies, uh, we are feeding the microbes, and they're fertilizing the plant. So I always call it microbe food now. And, and since I've written this third book, I realize how important adding the mycorrhizal fungi, which are microbe food getters. They are unbelievable. I, I can't. The, uh, the, I wrote the first book, Mycorrhizal Fungi, little teeny, little teeny couple of paragraphs, because that's what people knew about them back then. This was 1996 when I wrote the first book. And there was, you know, people, people knew about mycorrhizal fungi, but they, they still really couldn't grow them. And then, all of a sudden, they realized how important they were, so I did a revision of the book. The revised edition of Teaming with Microbes is because I had to add a new chapter on mycorrhizal fungi. Flash forward to 2000, you know, 15, 16, and all of a sudden, people recognized so many things that they thought they knew about mycorrhizal fungi were wrong, 
and that they are so important that they are not ubiquitous like we used to think they were. We used to think they were everywhere. You don't need to, they were there. You don't need to put them in the ground. No, 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 no. And then we discovered that they don't like phosphorus fertilizers. Holy crow. You know, what does everybody put it down on the, oh my goodness gracious, and so they don't grow then. And so all the studies where they were using phosphorus fertilizer, it said that they didn't have any impact. Well, that's because it was the phosphorus, wasn't the mycorrhizal fungi. So they had to go back and restudy everything without phosphorus fertilizers. And so all of a sudden, the body of knowledge was, there were 10 to 15,000 scientific papers that I went through for this book. They were not there in 1996. So, so I add mycorrhizal fungi. The fact that they can go out and get so much of the, of the nutrients, these essential nutrients that we talked about, for the plant without you having to do anything just demonstrates how important they are to the home gardener and the farmer. You have got to understand mycorrhizal fungi or you are going to be left in the dust. What I tell people is if you go to a nursery and, and they don't have mycorrhizal fungi, go to a different nursery because that one's not up to date. Right. And as we said before, enzymatic activity inside the plant. Absolutely. And so if you've got a situation uh, you know, where you've got very, very cool temperatures, you'd think, oh, there's no activity. Yeah, there is activity, but it's a different, different microbes than you might normally expect. So for example, in Anchorage, Alaska, where I live, during the winter months, we get snow cover usually, uh, and I, uh, uh, nobody that reads my column or that I know ever picks up their leaves. We run them over with a mower and just leave them. And during that winter month, there is more microbial activity right there at the soil level right underneath that snow than any other time of the year. You wouldn't think that, even though the temperature is so cold. But generally, the warmer the temperature, the higher the, the activity. And of course, as we know from composting, uh, you know, you've got different kinds of microbes all the time. So in some instances, it's fungi. some instances, it's actinomycetes. It's, it's, a, you know, it's a whole different world. I get phone calls from, from readers all the time saying, gee, you know, I, all of a sudden I started getting these little, these little black bumpy things in my lawn. How do I get rid of them? You know, I have to explain to them, no, 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 no. Earthworms weren't natural to the United States of America. They were, they got wiped out by the glaciers. Uh, and then along come the pilgrims, you know, and the ballast of the ship and, you know, Johnny Appleseed and, then, you know, the Oregon Trail. And, and people transport worms wherever they go, and whether it's purposeful or whether, whether it's accidental. And lo and behold, they came up to Anchorage late. You know, we, only, we didn't have very many people who weren't gardening. You know, they, we, and so now, I mean, the fish in Anchorage, Alaska, they don't know what a worm is. It's, uh, but <clears throat> I can tell you that people in Anchorage, Alaska know what worms are now because we have them. And they produce this beautiful worm casting. And I have to tell my readers, no, 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 no. The reason why vermicompost, worm compost is so important is because that worm casting concentrates what goes into the worm. Now the worm is only eating the, that organic material, leaves and et cetera, et cetera, which they pull into the ground incidentally. What a terrific way to you know, get organic material in the ground. They're only going after a couple of protozoa and bacteria, maybe a little fungus, you know. Uh, I suppose the occasional nematode, I don't know. But they don't really care about the leaf itself. That, so that just passes right through them. They're not eating that stuff. And when it does, it increases the phosphorus and the, Oh my gosh, it's just, it, it is a terrific thing to have happen. And so when you have worm castings, that's a good thing. In fact, vermicomposting is a terrific thing to do. It, it helps you be sustainable, you get something for your garden. It's a fascinating hobby. Now, you know, every time I ever talk about worms, these days people say, oh yeah, but what about those worms in Michigan and Wisconsin that are eating, you know, and causing all sorts of problems, they're eating the forest up. And, well, you know, these are, these are special worms that come from Asia. Uh, one of them is called the jumping worm because it, it moves so fast. Uh, and these worms eat the duff so quickly, uh, you know, that, 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 that what would normally take two years to decay goes in six months. The next thing you know, a weed comes in, in this particular instance in Michigan, it was garlic mustard. The garlic mustard is, grows like crazy because there's no leaves to keep the seeds and everything from germinating. And it grows like crazy. And the next thing you know, it produces an exudate. It's allopathic to the mycorrhizal fungi that support the maple trees. 
that feed, you know, wow. So the next thing you know, you don't have the maple trees. Uh, so you want to, you know, you obviously want to make sure you get good worms, that are the right worms. You don't want to introduce worms to your area that are, that are no good. Um, you know, and, and uh, it is a terrific thing. A pound of worms will eat a pound of garbage a day. And that produces a tremendous amount of soil, which is the best stuff you can ever use. Really terrific stuff. Well, let's talk more about that fungi stuff, because, I, I, you know, again, I mean, I, it struck me that these things are so important that I had to write a separate book for it. Now, i got to tell you, writing a book is one of the most unpleasant things you could possibly ever do. Uh, you know, you, a friend of mine described it as sort of going into a rabbit hole. You go in this little rabbit hole and you're down there, you gotta be by yourself, you're researching, you have to remember where you put things. Where did I read that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, it's, your train of thought is such that you, it's, it's hard, it, to be distracted is irritating beyond belief. So to, so to come to the conclusion after I swore I would never write another book again, that, that maybe this needed to be written about. You know, really, I think, sort of says something about the subject itself. And I really do believe that mycorrhizal fungi and the relationship they form with the plant, which is called the mycorrhiza or mycorrhizae, mycorrhizae and mycorrhizal fungi are going to be the number one tool for both farmers and home gardeners. I, there's little question in my mind. I'm almost 70. I've watched all manner of thing come and go. Um, this is something like, uh, this is sort of the culmination in many ways, you know, of everybody's soil food web dream, which is that you can, you can replicate the soil food web. Very hard to do. Uh, it's very hard to replicate from one compost pile to the next compost pile, you know, what, what you've got in terms of stuff, and that's why compost tea is controversial, etc. But in this instance, these mycorrhizal fungi, you apply the right one to the right plant, we now know which plants like what. Holy crow, the difference is night and day. It's that simple. Um, you know, uh, uh, and again, we, 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 we've got to get beyond the idea that they are ubiquitous, which is what, what really during the 90s, late 90s, and, and you know, p into the 2000s, people started to say, yeah, mycorrhizal fungi, but they're everywhere. That's not true, particularly when you're talking about gardening. Um, how, they, how they sporulate, when they produce spores, which means how they propagate themselves, um, you know, is very, very interesting. And in a pot situation, they might do it every year. But in a garden, they don't. And in a farm, they don't. That's been the experience. And so all of a sudden, well, wait a second, we thought they were coming back here. No, 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 no. Um, so you really gotta be thinking about these things. But when you see the pictures of A, themselves, these little teeny guys who are, you know, next to this big root going out into the soil. You can instantly see why they're so important. They're so small, they go out and into these pores and pull out this stuff. And then you see how they arrange themselves in the plant, inside the plant, not inside the cell of the plant, but they, they oh my God, they are the most gorgeous relationship and it's been going on for 400 million years. Now, I remember asking garden writers in 1996 if any of them had ever heard of a mycorrhizal fungi. I remember New York Times, Washington paper, Seattle paper, you know, not one garden writer raised their hands. We didn't know what mycorrhizal fungi were. And, and uh, you know, people I think now might know what they are, but I'm saying they have to know what they are. It's so important. It doesn't matter what you grow, other than those few that don't. It helps. It's phenomenal. You apply it to the soil and to the, to the uh, plant itself, yeah, if you can. As I say, I roll seeds in it. Uh, if I've got roots in a transplant, I'll roll it. But, but the advantage to also having it in the soil itself is that as the roots grow towards a mycorrhizal spore or propagule, you know, they, they activate it and poof, that you get a little, you get a little cell, a little clot of mycorrhizae, you know, and so you want to have lots of mycorrhizae all over the roots, not just at the spot where you first started. And so, yeah, having some in the soil is very, very important. Now, you've got to make sure this stuff is viable. And, you know, we've got to work on that. It's going to be tough because too much, too much heat can really impact it. 
cold doesn't seem to, to, to be a problem. But if you have it sitting in a container, you know, in the back of a hardware store, you know, in Cal Southern California for six months, you might have some viability problems. So viability is always the problem. You see all sorts of articles. You buy this kind, it's no good. You buy that kind, it's no good. You know, it's, 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 you gotta test them. Uh, you gotta know the date when they were made. Uh, and, and you gotta treat them, treat them properly. And what's really cool is that you can grow your own. You can also locate your own. So all of this stuff is described in the book, obviously, which is out in September, uh, no, it's out in January, but, um, you know, it's not gonna be just this book. I think, you know, after you hear this interview, of course, if you haven't already started to pick up almost daily a story about, uh, you know, how trees communicate with each other, et cetera, et cetera, that's the mycorrhizal fungi. All of which really, you know, my attention was caught by two people. Uh, you know, one is Dr. Elaine Ingham. Uh, she's the soil food rep guru as far as I'm concerned. And, and if you don't know Dr. Elaine Ingham and have not read her stuff and followed her on the web and, uh, you know, the, you really owe it to yourself to do so. Quite a fount of information. The other is Paul Stamets. Uh, you know, his mycelium running was an eye opener for, for those of us that, uh, you know, really weren't thinking about mushrooms and, you know, fungus in that kind of a way. And, and uh, Paul's books, and he's got about eight of them, uh, his products whew, just, just blow me away. Uh, you know, the, the, they both introduced me to the soil food web and to, and to the mycorrhizal situation, and, and uh, boy, I have to thank them for that. And I, and I hope you end up thanking them as a result of reading the book. Well, we don't use manure tea anymore, because uh, that's a little dangerous. Uh, you know, it, oh, it has the potential for E. coli, but compost tea clearly is something that yeah. I use all the time. Uh, and that's the new version of manure tea. The differences are twofold. One is you add energy to it to strip away the bacteria and the fungi and all the nematodes and protozoa. The other thing that you do is you, you can add a food to it to support either fungal dominance or bacterial dominance. And so you add air, you pump, and you, after 24, 48 hours, you, you, you have that tea, as opposed to the way you probably had to do it with stir your grandmother's big, fat, smelly, gooky stuff. <laughs> Lately, people are using compost extracts. Uh, you know, which is, a, which is a, something that's been around for a while. There have been machines made, uh, people have taken shop vacuums and created situations where you, f you stuff in the compact, you stuff in the compost and you, f you shove air through it and after 15 minutes you use, you use the liquid that comes out of it. Um, you don't multiply anything, but at least you strip it out of the compost so you can use it as a spray or put it into an area where you're not able to put compost. Ultimately, of course, compost, I think, is the best, but it doesn't stick to the leaves, uh, you know, which is, which is really why you want to get the compost tea, so. These compost teas are very controversial, though, very controversial. I've got any number of pictures in my, of before and after situations or with and without situations in my talks, and, and yet, you know, there are very few scientific papers. There are several, actually, I should say, but there, there are a few, uh, you know, that say, boom, best thing in the world, you know, and that's because people think it's supposed to be a miracle. It's a replacement for fertilizer, is what it is, as far as I'm concerned. You know, it's not supposed to make bigger plants. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's so that you don't have to use artificial f fertilizers. Simple as that. We compost because A, it helps us get rid of stuff, uh, and B, we end up with free stuff as a result of it that we can use, and C, the free stuff we end up with turns out to be the best stuff you can possibly use to grow plants, and so that's why we compost. Um, you know, the question is how to compost, and you know, it's gotten complicated over the years. It used to be you just put stuff down, you put a little bit of brown stuff, a little bit of uh, green stuff, and as long as it was three and a half cubic, you know, yards, it would, you know, it would, your feet, it would, uh, you know, it would make a nice hot pile. You know, now people are, uh, you know, 30 to one ratio of this, the other, blah, and it's gotten complicated. So in order to make it easy, what I always tell people when I give my compost lectures, is you use Google. Google is the best friend a composter could ever have. Now you probably don't expect to hear that, but you know, so you're sitting around, you've got newspaper, you've got some rabbit straw, and you've got some alfalfa food, which the rabbit you know, would have eaten, but the rabbit's now dead. And you've got, um, you know, maybe you've got uh, uh, a bunch of old, couple of cases of old lettuce. Well, how do you get 30 to one nitrogen out of that? I mean, how do you figure that out? 
Well, it turns out now, using wonderful you know, computer situations, you can punch a button and get a compost calculator. So you say the compost calculator, it has inputs. Gee, I've got lettuce, uh, X amount. I've got X amount of you know, alfalfa. I've got rabbit straw. And you push a button, it tells you how much of each to put into the pile in order to get the perfect compost. Pretty amazing. Um, it's, it's really easy to do. Basically, it's brown and green. You mix a bag of leaves and a 50-pound bag of, uh, you know, of alfalfa meal, and uh, you're going to end up with compost. Uh, it just happens by itself. Now, the thing that people don't seem to understand is when you start getting compost, you have to continue to turn the pile so that every bit of that pile gets hot. Home gardeners don't generally do that. And oftentimes, they don't get real good compost. They get putrefying matter. That can have some bad consequences, bad stuff in it. So, so you want to make sure that you keep it heated all the time, that you've got enough green and you've got enough brown standing by that you can add it to the compost pile so that you can keep it going and so that you can get compost. And it shouldn't take all that long. You know, I can make compost in about uh, 21, 22 days if I, if I work it, or if I, if, I, if I get my wife to work it. Uh, but uh, compost is something everybody ought to be doing. And if they're not doing compost, a simple worm bin is the way to go. Because you just take the stuff and put it into the worm bin and it makes the compost for you. One's thermal, one's obviously biological. Oh, don't get a rotating tumbler. <laughs> and the reason why I say don't get a rotating tumbler is, is, is answered in the first book, and that's because you're not getting all of the soil food web into your compost. You know, you're getting what you put into the compost bin plus what comes up from the soil underneath the compost bin. So you get worms and beetles and all sorts of stuff work their way into the compost pile from below. If you put it into one of those bins, unless you take a couple of shovels full of soil every now and then, you're not getting the stuff that you really want to have in it. Okay. So it come, and it usually comes out kind of wet and sloppy because it's not really the best way to go. Yeah. Well, you know, the compost pile should get hot enough so that the weeds are killed. That's and, and that's the point about home gardeners. If you're, if you're getting weeds in your compost, you're not getting it hot enough. You know, it's, um, it's, 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 it's pretty simple. You can shred them. You know, some people shred up before they put it in the compost, but, but basically what you want to do is just get it hotter. And that means you either turn it over more, and get some green into it. Uh, and you've got to turn the inside. You know, the inside has, is, is where it's hot. The outside has to go back in. You've got to get every part of it has to be done right, so. The one thing that I don't talk about in the, in the in the second book, but I think it's, it's evident when you read it. And, and that's, it becomes almost sort of a, uh, uh, almost a spiritual kind of thing. When you understand what goes on inside a plant, you can look at a plant differently. And, and in this particular instance, what, what becomes evident after you read the book, I think anyway, at least it did for me, as I researched the book and finally put it all together, that what happens inside a cell is, is, is very analogous to what's happening, say, for example, inside this room. I mean, we could, we could just say that this, the cell is just a bigger example of this room. You and I are two enzymes. We are, you know, we are taking ideas and we're passing them back and forth and shaping them and you know, bending them and folding them. And, and, now, and then we're putting them into a, into a transportation system and infrastructure and sending them out of the cell using these cameras, the microphone. We have signals coming into the room. We've got air coming in through these little holes. Up in, it's the exact same thing as a cell. You take the state of Florida, it's the exact same thing. FedEx does exactly you know, what happens to the stuff that it comes out of a ribosome? You know, the, where does that protein go? Well, the protein ends up, you know, in, in the endoplasmic reticulum, getting a label put on it and getting shipped off to the right spot. The same thing happens to Florida. In fact, if you take the United States, it acts just like a cell. The infrastructure of the United States connecting the East and the West just the, just the internet lines, when you take a look at them, they look exactly, exactly like the microtubules inside a cell emanating from a nucleus out to the walls. It's unbelievable. And then you take the whole Earth. So it, it, it's sort of like, the, I call it the Horton, here's a who theory of life. And, and you can start with that cell. And after you read that book, you're never really sure whether, maybe we're all just part of a little plant cell here. Uh, 
It all goes back to plants, it all goes back to plants, and eventually it all goes back to soil. That's, that's really the bottom line. And we've got to protect our soil. We've got to treat it so that it can support the soil food web, including those important mycorrhizal fungi, obviously the roots that take up the food so that the plant can eat. It all starts with that soil. Whether it's composting, whether you're adding fertilizers, whether you're adding mulches, it's the soil that counts. That is the basic thing. And if we don't treat our soil better, we're going to end up having a terrible situation. Soil is where the earth holds carbon. Simple as that. Mycorrhizal fungi bring carbon that comes from the air and put it into the soil. That's where about 30% of the carbon that's in the soil comes from. And, and we are losing so much soil every single year, which we will not get back. It's so important in the world, not just the United States, that we start treating our soils like they're alive and like we want to keep them alive. That's sort of the bottom line of all three of the books. They're really all soil books, they're all related, uh, and the message is always the same. You gotta treat the soil right.